Uh, firstly, thank you to everybody that's been involved. As a foreigner, I think, um, we over in the UK across the pond have um, the situation where we feel that the United States has the best and the worst of everything. You're right. And You're right. it's been an absolute privilege to be involved with what has to be the absolute best of everything this weekend. So thank you to everybody. Good. And. <laughs> My specific question is uh, directed, I guess, um, primarily it would be to Brian, but uh, to any, uh, any of the other uh, <laughs> distinguished panel members who would like to comment. Um, we are hearing via the media and via YouTube and via all of these other things that we're bombarded with about the huge benefits of the ketogenic diet for reversal of cancer, for reversal of Alzheimer's, and the absolute massive benefit of ketone bodies in reversal of degenerative disease in um, many areas. So um, just to put this one to bed once and for all, I'd really like to hear your comments. Okay. When you talk about a, a shift in diet, uh, the scientific community is grasping at straws, and they're looking at the best of the worst rather than the best of the best. So as an example, I don't know how many times, it has to be thousands, tens of thousands, that people have said, well, the scientific community says the Mediterranean diet is the best. And by the way, I happen to concur with them compared to other cultural diets. It is the best of cultural diets that have been used for years. Why? Because it has more plant-based food in it and less animal-based food in it. The same with the ketogenic diet. When you start to look at it, we get people off heavy amounts of meats, heavy amounts of processed foods. We put them on a better diet. And lo and behold, these bright-eyed, bushy-tailed researchers who have never changed diet at all see improvements that they never saw because this is all like a whole new world to them. They get excited and say that that's better. We don't have time. The one thing I hope you listening here in the auditorium as well as around the world have gleamed from this weekend is we don't have time to moderate. We don't have time to be bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. That we've got to get to what really works. And what really works is a plant-based diet, not putting a little bit more plant-based in and a little less bad things in. And, you know, why mess around, go in a carousel? Now, bottom line is, for the scientific community, congratulate them that at least they're acknowledging this. So let's start with that. At least they're acknowledging the fact that diet has something to do with this. And yes, if you take away sugar, which who was the first institute that came up with that 35 years ago? Hippocrates. And that's what they're saying in this. Take away sugar. Basically, you're going to have results. Now, can you imagine if you not only take away the bad and evil, but you put in the good and building? That's what's lacking in these diets. Yes, yeah. But, you know, and, 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 you know, the mistake that I think is made is that we have these uh, boy-like pissing matches. Who's right? Who's wrong? Uh, nobody has to be wrong. We just should aspire to the right, the best, all of the time. So great question. Thank you. Okay. Just two little questions and one comment. Um, I just bought a whole bunch from the raw food world of methylcobalamin B12 patches. And I think uh, you said that that's not correct, right? Well, I don't know what your patches are made of, so I can't say it's correct or not. But it's, they said that cyanocobalamin is not right because it's, it's synthetic. It's made from cyanide, so the, the correct, correct form is methyl. So this is a methyl cyanobalamin, okay? Yeah. Methyl cyanobalamins are chemically made in laboratories. Okay. They're not bacteria. They're not okay. cultured. They're not alive. And they will put into the bloodstream what mimics and looks like B12, but you're not going to actually absorb that into the cell on any significant level. Great. Yeah. Okay. That answers that. And um, also, where do we get aluminum from? Where do you get aluminum? Yeah, like and aluminum in our bodies. Well, if you live in the New York area, the metropolitan area, there has been so much aluminum dumped here from the time my great-great-grandfather was in this area. Uh, it's pervasive. You know, heavy metals are in the atmosphere. Uh, mm -hmm. They're seeding part of the planet. And aluminum is in the atmosphere. Uh, when I first heard about this, I thought, well, here's another wacky hippie thing being told to me. And then I started to look into the skies and realize that this is not wacky. 
Right? It's an authentic thing. Now, why it's happening, I don't know, and I'm not a conspiracy type of guy, but it is happening. Aluminium or aluminum is coming down on us. And so besides the factories and besides Jersey City, when I was a kid growing up in this area, they thought I was cute because I identified the factory from the odor in the air. That's not a joke. When I was growing up in this area, the odor was so thick, so rancid in the air, that on a daily basis it would be a new odor. And if the wind blew from one factory, I'd know in the other factory. And rather than my family saying, let's run for the hills, they thought it was cute. Well, actually, on that issue, um, when, where I was growing up and where I wrote my first book, When Smoke Ran Like Water, when people would come to the town, they'd say, what's that smell? And my grandfather would say, it smells like money. <laughs> That's really because the idea, the idea was that in, in those days, people thought that if you had the smell of coal and all of the other things, in this case, coke, iron ore, and in fact, zinc refining, that it was the smell of money. But sources of aluminum are not just uh, from the general environment. There are some, um, it's used as an ingredient, as a so-called inert ingredient in a lot of things. It also can be found in uh, antiperspirants and antiperspirants that are applied to the apocrine gland area on underarm can be more readily absorbed in, into the body. And uh, there are theories that this is part of the explanation for some, some of the changes in, in breast cancer. So it's another example of one of these things that where we have adopted a technology without ask, asking what it's doing for our health. I also want to th thank it, you. It can also be found in baking powder, and so oh, it might right. find its way into baked goods that you purchase. And cookware also. Yeah, it. and cookware. Mm -hmm. um, so I learned a lot. This is definitely going to change my life. But uh, I wish we had had an expert on vaccines as well, so maybe next time. We didn't want to break the camel's back. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's a... You're right, though. She's yeah, right. Hi, my uh, question is for Jeffrey Smith. Um, what could you tell us about the Arctic apple and um, any health problems that you may know of, of what's going on with that and how close we are to having that pushed into our food system? Okay. Um, there's a current, the Arctic apple or the Botox apple, the non-browning apple, is before the FDA or the USDA. Nothing goes before the FDA, really. It's just a voluntary consultation process. And the apple industry is against it. But the USDA hasn't ever really turned down a single application from the biotech industry. So we don't know if we're going to have to avoid apples in order to avoid GMOs. Why it's, is the apple industry against it? Um, because they know that a lot of exports um, go to countries that are sensitive to GMOs. And that if the U.S. apple industry produced GMO apples, foreign importers may refuse apples that are non-GMO, uh, and so there'll be, the, there'll be the blanket rejection or the extra expense for the non-GMO producers to segregate, test, verify, and then they'll pay for any contamination as well, which could cause significant problems if there is contamination by the GM. So when 25% of the corn farmers in the United States or the corn acreage in the United States was genetically engineered, Europe rejected 99.6% of U.S. corn, not accepting the corn from the 75% of the farmers or acreage that was non-GMO because they didn't trust it. Now, uh, this apple is created from a double-stranded RNA technology. So they create a RNA piece that silences DNA expression. Now, the double-stranded RNA at about 22 base pairs, it becomes um, a regulatory element that can influence sequences that are similar. And it's possible that by eating the apple, you might end up changing your expression of DNA because the RNA that affects the apple's browning might also affect something that we don't know about in us. The, there was a study done on honeybees where they exposed them to a double-stranded RNA that was supposed to be a control. 
And there was a double-stranded RNA exposed to honeybees, and it was supposed to be a control and not have any influence. And it changed the expression of 1,400 genes, 10% of the genome. The double-stranded RNA technology may be far more dangerous than what they're doing now with GMOs, and they want to introduce double-stranded RNA as pesticides that are sprayed, and the double-stranded RNA can affect us by absorbing it through the skin. So this is an extremely dangerous technology, and the apple is one of them, one of the crops that uses it. There's a wheat that's proposed. Wheat is not genetically engineered, but there's one that's proposed that was found the regulatory element, the double-stranded RNA, was matched against the human genome, and they found hundreds and hundreds of spots in the human genome that might theoretically be regulated accidentally. Now, uh, one more question about that. I know um, blue corn is not genetically modified, correct? Um, would this apple be able to contaminate any apple, like Honeycrisp apples, Gala apples? Would there be any that are more likely to be contaminated or less likely to be contaminated? Good question. I don't know the answer. Okay. I don't know the answer whether apples will contaminate other apples from different uh, unrelated or different families. Can, can you, you said something that really surprised me, and I may be misinformed. Did you say that wheat is not genetically modified? No wheat is genetically modified? Right. Wheat has been selectively bred, but it's not transgenic. Okay. Uh, in other words, they don't take genes from one species and force it into the DNA of others. Tomatoes used to be genetically engineered, and that was also, it might have been double-stranded RNA. That was taken off in 97. Potatoes were taken off in 2001. McDonald's rejected potatoes that were genetically engineered for its french fries, and so did Pringles and Burger King, so that was the end of that. Uh, the reasons for those rejections were, again, they were concerned about market rejection. Um, for years, Frito-Lay did not allow genetically engineered corn in its chips, and then after a while, since no one seemed to be complaining about it in the United States, they quietly allowed GMOs into their corn chips. Now we're seeing a reversal of fortunes for the biotech industry as more and more companies remove GMOs from market pressure. Okay, over here? Yes. Um, if somebody back home asked me what this conference was about, I will say a return to sanity. <laughs> I have a question about making almond milk and blending. I understand that blending does some damage in making smoothies. So I was wondering if there's an alternative. I have never tried this, but could you put almonds through a masticating juicer and squeeze the juice out of it that way and add water if necessary? Yes, you absolutely can put your almonds, soaked almonds, yes. through a masticating juicer and then soak them in water uh, and then put it through a, 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 a mesh bag, we call a nut milk bag, and, uh, and you'll get milk. It won't be as creamy, mm -hmm. won't be a, a, as much fat, right. but that's okay. You'll still have a nice milk. And you can do it, it doesn't have to be almond milk. You can do this with sunflower seeds, exactly. uh, which are lower in fat. And a lot of people have, who have uh, tree nut allergies can still eat sunflower seeds or sesame seeds. So we agree that that's a healthier way oh, to go than blending. A million times healthier. Okay. And one last, one last other question about stevia. Have you used stevia in, in cooking? And does it, uh, not in cooking, but in food preparation as a sweetener. Yes, I do use stevia. I actually have a stevia plant. Um, I live in California. I don't know if you can grow stevia in a pot in your house. That's a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really nice in tea. Um, of course, it's not... <clears throat> You can't use it like white sugar in something. You'd have to use a more processed uh, version of stevia. Mm -hmm. I would suggest that if you do it, do that, that you buy the stevia that is pure stevia and doesn't have any fillers in it. You have to be very careful with it because it's extremely sweet. But yes, I, I use it. And uh, I, I would suggest that you not use it in everything because it just maintains your sweet tooth. Right. 
you know, you're, you just still really want the sweets all the time. But it, it, at least you can have, have some sweets and it doesn't affect your blood sugar. This is how she pacifies Dan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you all. Not thank quite. you. <laughs> Hi. Um, can the detrimental effects of long-term sleep deprivation, i.e. the stress on the body, be reversed when adequate sleep is restored? What's really interesting about sleep is that we, the body needs melatonin. Uh, melatonin is what we make naturally when we sleep in the dark. So it's really important to sleep in the dark with no televisions on, no electrical devices near you, because in fact, a microwave radiation from cordless phones, from baby monitors, from routers, and from cell phones all interfere with the body's natural production of melatonin. Melatonin is a very powerful natural antioxidant. It repairs damage wherever it's occurred. So I was actually tempted to write a little book called Stop Worrying, Sleep in the Dark, and Eat Your Broccoli. Because, <laughs> in fact, those basic things are going to be very, very helpful uh, for your health. I should say eat your non-GMO broccoli, but broccoli is non-GMO so far. Right. Oh. Uh, I want to give a plug for Jeff's film, by the way. He's, it, it, really, it really works uh, very well, and I think it should be made available to every public library in this country. It would change, it would change the way people talk about this uh, issue uh, widely. But sleep deprivation causes a whole host of chronic degenerative diseases, without question. And the mechanism by which it might be working is through this melatonin. Because interesting thing about melatonin, in Sweden, they have registries of people from the time they're born till they die. So what they were able to learn is that women who are blind, blind, have half the risk of breast cancer as women who are sighted. Mm. Interesting? That's interesting. And blind women have twice as much melatonin as sighted women. Isn't that? Because they're always in the dark. So <clears throat> it's yet another. Not suggesting they all go blind. Not at all. <laughs> but I am suggesting that you do what I do with, I, as I travel these crazy schedules, which is use a sleep mask and make sure you really sleep in darkness. Close the shades, get all the funny lights with all the indicators out of your bedroom, unplug as much as possible. And it really makes a huge difference. So the answer is God's given us DNA, DNA works to repair damage. No matter what habits you had before you walked into this conference, you can fix them. And because DNA has repair enzymes and because it tells our cells when they should die, knowing when to die at the right time is important for your health. It's called apoptosis. Because you have repair processes that go on naturally, if you can sleep, you can really recover a tremendous amount of damage that may have occurred. I'm talking about seven years. It's not because of... Of no. the dark, it's because of noisy neighbors and living situations. No, no, whatever the cause, mm -hmm. of course, you eliminate the source of the insomnia as best you can. Understand something else I learned recently at a, a conference in uh, Austria. Uh, disruptions of sleep are actually a natural thing that happens with aging. And you actually sleep and wake and sleep and wake several times in a night. That's normal and it's healthy. And as you get older, especially those of us who've been mothers, you, your, your ability to hear sounds is, you know, you, you can waken very easily. But you can also go back to sleep. That's one of the blessings of meditation. Learning whatever meditation you can that will help you to relax and get back to that state of rest is what, what you need to do. Thank you. Another one also about... Wait, on that point, um, the consumption of food sprayed with glyphosate can mess up the melatonin and also the ability for the body to detox. Okay. So buy, buying organic is certainly non-GMO, but also organic now that they're spraying Roundup, which has glyphosate in it on so many other crops. Dr. Davis was spot on. Out of the 600 books I've read on sleep deprivation, as it contributes to disease, uh, Dr. DeLement, who's now in his late 80s out of Stanford, to me has the most brilliant work of 60 years. Uh, it's the promise of sleep. Read it, the promise of sleep. And it really details what Dr. Davis so well articulated here. Well, thank you. All and, and another thing about sleep is make sure that you eat early so you have plenty exactly. of time exactly. between the time that you eat and the time that you go to bed and make your last meal of the day light with that, not a lot of fat. That also will help you to sleep more deeply. 
um, in less amount of time. I get cravings for my healthy organic popcorn with coconut oil <laughs> and a movie at like yeah. 10 or 11. You, you'd have to have that in the afternoon. Go to the matinee. <laughs> okay, one more thing. Um, um, doesn't, uh, the, doesn't blending eliminate or lessen the concern of the improper food combination since it's already broken down? I may have this wrong, but I, I thought that the problem had to do with the food being broken down together inside the body. I, I guess it's more for Dr. Clement, because I know that's, you're very against uh, that. Chem chemistry is chemistry. So if I put one chemistry that's inappropriate to be with another, no matter what form it's in, it's still inappropriate chemistry. So we don't, we're not big fans of putting, there's four major rules. Let's just go through them. Proteins of any type with starchy carbohydrates. That's the biggest no-no. If you get that one, you're 50% there with combining food. So a nut should never go with a sprouted grain. Okay. And I don't care if I blend it and kill 90% of it. Bottom line is I still have the chemistry of those. The second one is fruits when eaten. Now, who should not eat fruits? People with catastrophic diseases. No fruit at all. So if you're fighting cancers, if you're fighting HIV, if you're fighting severe uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, fungal diseases, yeast problems, lower high blood sugar, no sugar of any type, including fruit, should be part of it. But when eating fruit, not even the healthiest person among us here should eat more than 15% by weight of their diet as fruit. Because when we were up in Boston, we were lucky we used the MIT laboratories at that stage to discover that you spill over that, you get to 15 uh, to 20 percent, and you start to have more sugar in the bloodstream. So the glucose levels start to go up. And as you heighten it, it more and more blood sugar concerns. We used to think, you know, from the uh, misinformation from Dr. Steer at Harvard, that there was a difference between these things. There's not. Fructose, as far as the body's concerned, is no different than glucose, sucrose, dextrose, um, any of it. And a matter of fact, in one of my books, I actually write about uh, premature aging is expedited by the use of fructose. Now, most of the studies, not all, were not done on fruit, but the same fructose that you get in high fructose con corn syrup is what I get out of a mango. It's fructose. That's what it is. So these are things you have to understand. The other thing is one fruit at a time is ideal. You're really a healthy, healthy person. A fruit salad when it's hot in the summer, no big deal. The next group is fruits and vegetables should never go together. So you'll never f see a tomato in our salads at Hippocrates. Tomato's a fruit. Oh. And it's the other thing. Now, the vegetables, are you including greens and in vegetables like um, this young lady mentioned before? She did not include that in. When you say greens and vegetables. And vegetables. No, she said yes, like I said that leaves are, are different. You can combine um, leaves with uh, in your... Um, smoothie in the morning, uh, mm -hmm. but I wouldn't put other kinds of vegetables, broccoli or root vegetables. With right. It. And so then the last rule, quite simply, Leaves. is first is what? No proteins and starches. Mm -hmm. Second is fruits, if at all consumed, should never be more than 15% and always ripe, the thing I neglected to say. No fruit is picked ripe, including organic fruit. By default, apples are picked ripe because... They prevented them from using Allard, which was a ripening agent. As Jeffrey said yesterday, which stunned me, what are they now spraying on to? Some genetic uh, nightmare? They're spraying on fruit to ripen them prematurely? Oh, yeah, they're spraying glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup. They're spraying it on a variety of... There's, it's approved now for 160 types of fruits and vegetables. So it's used in most grains, pulses... It's lentils, uh, oats, barley. So if it's not organic, it may have high concentrations of glyphosate, which, as we said, is linked to heart disease, cancer, obesity, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, art, uh, autism, wasting disease, and Alzheimer's, among others. In insanity. Yeah, you name so it. So then the last two rules, and then we'll move on, uh, is fruits and vegetables never go together. And lastly, melons are to be eaten alone. As you know, when we eat melons, we all have a cue next to where? The bathroom. the bathroom. Because it rushes through the body like a rocket ship. So you don't want to put anything in the way of a melon. Elder melons, if you're really healthy and strong and can endure that level of sugar, can be eaten with other melons, hot days, occasionally, you know, not a practice. 
No, thank you. Thank you. We're over here. Um, yes. This is about the recent article that was in the New York Times about the genetically modified foods. It was kind of a pro-GMO article, which really concerned me because it was in the New York Times. But there was... <laughs> New York well, doesn't get it right all the time. Okay. Well, there was a professor, um, Pam Ronald, plant pathology professor at the University of California, and she said that we, the non-GMO supporters, are ignoring decades of scientific studies demonstrating the safety and wide-reaching benefits of genetically engineered foods. Now, I mean, why... How can she write that? And, and <laughs> yeah, well, the, the New York Times has been a pro-GM outfit for uh, many, many years. Okay. And uh, I squared off with Pam Ronald on Dr. Oz a couple of years ago. Um, she uh, is a renowned pro-biotech advocate. I mentioned her book uh, as, you know, one of the Bill Gates' references as to why he's so pro-GMO. Um, it's an easily dismembered book. All of her references are easily uh, dismissed. dismissed because they're, they're not based on real independent science. They're based on the myth-making. And she is one of the, the speakers. Now, I was told by someone in an email from Hawaii that the reporter from the New York Times essentially went to Hawaii to write an article uh, with her agenda intact. And so she kept looking for a story that gave the pro-GM agenda and then found a minority um, member of the council that had actually banned the planting of GMOs. This person was against it, so she picked up on this person and used him as the, um, as the uh, protagonist. But there was three, article, three letters to the editor written in the Times um, that blasted the article, and the article was really pathetic. Um, and the... One of the people that blasted it was uh, Dr. David Schubert because the article said that there's a consensus for safety. Now, there's hundreds of doctors that have signed petitions, scientists that say there's no consensus for safety. And Dr. David Schubert is a senior scientist at the Salk Institute, and he said there's no consensus for safety, among other things. And, I mean, it's a – what I, I deal with this all the time where – I mean, that article uh, – tried to degrade me or, or, you know, discredit me as well. I actually haven't read the article. I've just been, haven't gotten to it yet. It's like it, I don't really pay attention to those because there's so many of them. There's so many of them, and it really, it's like, from my mind, yes, they're going to get a bunch of people to believe it, but we don't need to get the majority of Americans on our side. We just need a certain percentage of people avoiding GMOs, and they're gone. And the people that we're going to, the moms, the healthcare professionals, the health conscious shoppers, the sick people, certain religious people, they really listen to this, the truth that we gave out yesterday, for example. And so it's like these guys are up against the wall. They're spending an unprecedented amount of money now trying to get some kind of foothold in a deteriorating consciousness. So yesterday... They posted something in some digital magazine uh, offering media an opportunity to, to debunk me with a real expert. So they're, they've been attacking me as well. And then they had this whole sort of half-truth bio about me that is bizarre. And I'm like, I look at it and go, I must be doing something right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But I, may, may I add a comment, um, if I may? Um, the, the big book I wrote, The Secret History of the War on Cancer, documented a pattern of deceit, dismissal, and denial with respect to tobacco that started in the 1930s when the German and Argentinian governments had national institutes to study tobacco hazards. This is before the Internet, so nobody's ever heard of it unless you've read my big book. And those governments knew then that smoking was bad for health. This is the 1930s. What happened after the war was that scientists working for the tobacco industry and the U.S. government, who were also working for the asbestos industry and the benzene industry, went to Germany, gathered up all the data that existed on this, which I found sometimes in the Cleveland or in Cincinnati buried in, in files, 
And nobody in the public understood that the dangers of tobacco and asbestos and benzene and vinyl chloride were known for decades before the public became aware of it. I am not an expert on GMOs, but I know enough that if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck. And this is a duck in the sense that this example here, the story that you just relayed from the New York Times, industry pays millions of dollars to scientific experts, and they may be well-meaning. Let's give them the possibility that they may be well-meaning. They're often naive, unless they're really hired guns, and they are hired guns sometimes. And there is legitimate scientific complexity about these issues. Let's be clear. There's a lot of complicated science here, and a lot of it remains very confusing, certainly in the area of GMOs, certainly in the area of cell phone safety. Most of you never had any idea that a cell phone is a two-way microwave radio. If somebody has said to you, here, you're going to give a microwave radio to your baby as a pacifier, people would go, what? They wouldn't do it. So even the name of what they call the product becomes part of, of the whole system. So I would go back to you and I would say, I think your strongest argument so far is that the Europeans say no. So are they all just uh, foolish? Or do they know something that we need to find out? And then the fact that the New York Times runs articles like this is a sad reflection of the effectiveness of a strategy that was first honed for tobacco and refined with asbestos, which basically says where there's scientific evidence of concern, manufacture doubt. If you can create doubt in the public mind, doubt becomes your product. And as long as people aren't sure that something's a problem, well, it's much more convenient to continue consuming things. Um, let me just share one other thought. When Bella Abzug was alive, I was privileged to uh, work with her, although given the way she treated her friends, I was glad I wasn't her enemy. <laughs> but Bella was a brilliant woman, and she said we needed girl cots. Boy cots say no. Girl cots say yes. We demand the right to buy food that is not genetically modified. We demand the right to have safer cell phones and technology in our homes for our children. And if we create the market, Cheerios, if, we, if people rally around buying Cheerios that's not GMO, it's a very powerful message. And the market does work. In women's cosmetics now, there's a whole bunch of companies that are making less toxic cosmetics. Um, I'm, women are not going to give up cosmetics. You know, some of us use a lot less than we used to, but you're still finding a market for safer things is going to be very important and very attractive. And using market forces in a constructive way here with girl cots is, I think, one of your strongest arguments on, on the GMO. So maybe we can try it. Well, it was Bella. Isn't that a great word, girl cots? I think I've, I've had one imposed on me since I've been married. <laughs> Where are we? We're here, Over yes. Here. Uh, Dr. Davis, could you speak about um, Bluetooth in automobiles? Huh? Because I now have this car where I'm hands-free, so I'm legal, mm -hmm. but I worried the other day when you said about my head becoming an antenna. No, 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 no. <laughs> Let me explain. That's, I'm so glad you asked. I'm really glad you asked. Let me explain. The latest study from Sweden that I mentioned very briefly in my talk a few days ago, which is the only study in the world to have followed people for 25 years or more who've used cell phones. It's the only study in the world. They were able to get data on people who had primarily used a phone in their car with a Bluetooth antenna going through the car compared to people who, let's say this is a phone, used a phone like this as they're driving. Okay. Now, a Bluetooth through your car means that the antenna is going through your car roof. You understand? If you do not have a Bluetooth in your car going through your car roof or plug into your former cigarette lighter adapter, which you can do because you can get one of these adapters, if you do not have either of those two devices, then your head becomes the antenna when you hold the phone next to your head. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. But if you have the Bluetooth device, according to this latest study just published a few weeks ago from Sweden, there, you do not have an increased risk of brain cancer from cell phones. You do not. Now, having said that, one of my concerns and there, is that, what about the baby in the back seat? 
What about these Teslas which have actual kind of like an iPad computer right there in the front? I wrote to Tesla and I asked them for information on their Wi-Fi exposure. The uh, Guess what? I'm still waiting for an answer. But Tesla is not, may not be the worst. They may not, may not be bad at all. But they're not even thinking about this. And I think we do have to think about this because now you have cars that have Wi-Fi that tell you your tire pressure. That's a Wi-Fi signal. Maybe it's, maybe it's fine. I don't know if it is. And I think we have a right to ask. I don't think there's anything wrong with asking that question. But I'm glad you asked about the car as well. That's important. I have the tire thing too. No, no, but, but I, I'm not, I want to be clear. The fact that we don't know mm -hmm. does not mean it's a problem, but it does mean we need to find out. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to re-ask the question in a way because I want your answer to be clear to me and everyone else. You said yesterday that infants or little children have a 10 time greater exposure. This study most likely looked at adults. Absolutely right. And what I said specifically is that the bone marrow of the skull of an infant, when tested with a simulation that's been validated and computer generated, their bone marrow will absorb 10 times more radiation from a cell phone smack against the head, not from a Wi-Fi in a car. Okay? Oh, okay. And that bone marrow of the child will absorb 10 times more radiation than the bone marrow of, of an adult. And their brain, which is mostly fluid and fat, will absorb twice as much radiation as compared to that of an adult. Well, do you suspect that the child in the back seat or next to the Tesla, and I, I, I actually looked, looked at Tesla and it's actually an iPod in the front of the car. Do you iPad. think, iPad, yeah. uh, can you, um, would you believe, as I'm thinking right now, that it most likely would harm the baby or the child if 10-year-old? Distance is your friend. The distance from even the front to the back seat is a few feet. And so it may not be, is the answer. And, and I want to be really clear. I don't want to create the notion that you've got to take your phones and throw them away, although I think everybody should be using their phone less. And as I said before, I think we have to stop living our lives as though we're in an emergency state all the time that you have to be able to answer 24-7, that you have to keep the phone so you can feel it vibrate and let, and so you're, you're being really cool because you're, look at, you're pretending that you're talking to the person you're looking at, but you're really thinking about three other things at the same time and not fully engaging socially, which is happening, I think, to, to all of us. We think we're multitasking, but in fact, evidence is very clear that multitasking is diminishing the quality of our social experiences with everybody nowadays. I have, I have a new term for it. It's called the anti-social media. That's very good. Anti-social media. And yeah. Rafi, the children's, thank you, Rafi, the children's singer, has a, a wonderful book called Light Web, Dark Web, where he talks about the fact that these tools are really distancing people from one another. We think they're connecting us, but they're creating barriers in a, in a strange way that we don't even appreciate. When you, when you sit down with your husband or your wife, and they pick up, they take a phone call and you're having dinner? I mean, people have got to reclaim the private life that is so important for our health. I'll try to be brief, but I'll add to the story. They introduced cell phones in Switzerland because Switzerland was so economically endowed in those days. And I was enthralled. They, uh, a guest came to us from Switzerland, a lovely man, with a suitcase and showed me the phone, and I just couldn't believe it. And, you know, yeah, my mind was, you know, does the car have a wire connected to the curb? He said, no, there is no wire. I just couldn't get that through my head. And he said, you know, the next time he came back to us, eight months later, he said, I threw away my cell phone. And I said, what, you're insane. What do you talk, you could talk on the phone? He said, we realized in great part in Switzerland that it took time out of our life, that we were no longer taking quiet time driving in the car. So what Dr. Davis said and what all of you clapped to, please remember this. I know this is a high-speed lunacy, constantly thinking you have to communicate. NYU here has to give, in the first year freshman classes now, a class on communication because I can tell you hiring young people today Eight out of ten do not know how to communicate anymore. 
So uh, there's no doubt that the agribusiness, the pharmaceuticals, and the government uh, have been misinforming us for uh, a very long time, and they're spending billions and even trillions of dollars to do so. So having been at the seminar for the last three days, I'm going to say thank you until you tell me to stop. Thank you, 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 thank you. And thank you. Okay. Because, uh, you know, we're bombarded by this, obviously, wealth of misinformation. And to have real, accurate information and sitting here is just – the energy is so positive, and it's like, it's like I don't have to, you know, block this and block this thought and block that. Just it's free-flowing information. So – um, I want to thank the whole panel for that. And then I have a question, too, for Sherry. Um, Sherry, right? Um, I became a raw vegan eight months ago. As you can see, eat raw, live long. It's amazing. My sky is purple. What's um, it say? Eat raw, live long. Yeah. Eat That's raw. good. Yeah. And the question I have for you is at what temperature does food uh, become compromised? Now, I've heard 105. I've heard 114. I've seen, we've seen amazing photos of food that is uh, energized and it's charged. And then you see the SAD, standard American diet food, that's not charged. So w that temperature to me is like the most, it's like learning my one, two, threes. Uh, if, is it 105, 107? Whatever the number it is, it is. But that's, a, that's an important thing uh, when I'm shopping, uh, you know, for food or uh, that it's raw or that the internal composition of the food is not compromised, especially the energy levels, which... I think raw, most raw vegans will tell you that we're, uh, you know, we, we, love the, we love the energy from the food. Well, it's... I want to add a question to oh, okay. that for you. It's, it's related, Sherry. Um, what about uh, tea, uh, coffee-like beverages, and things of this sort? Uh, if one is going to use warm liquids, how, when, and how do you recommend, you know, combining, et cetera? Right. Okay, so I'll, I'll take that in two parts. Um, first of all, uh, the the... The safe temperature is going to depend on how on the water content and the fat content mm -hmm. and the kind of nutrients that it has. So, for example, vitamin C is much more delicate than, um, than other kinds of, like, protein, for example. Mm -hmm. So if something has a high water content and you have it in a dehydrator, it's going to take a lot longer before the core temperature becomes the temperature that you have the dehydrator set at, because the, what you have the dehydrator set at is going to warm the air, but it's going to take quite a while before it penetrates and starts to actually get warm enough to cause evaporation. Mm -hmm. So water content is a big factor. And also the kind of fat, if there is fat involved, um, some fats are very susceptible to rancidity and others are very stable. So I can't give you an absolute answer, right. but, um, but what I read is that at about 118 degrees for 20 minutes, mm -hmm. in most cases, is safe. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Dr. Clement might know more about that than I, but that's the information that is most prevalent out there. Um, and, um, and also, again, the amount of time that you have it in a dehydrator is going to make a difference, too, because you don't want to have something like <clears throat> flax in a dehydrator for a long period of time, just sitting there being warm because the omega-3 fatty acids can become rancid, you know. So really fat and water content and also the, the thickness of, of what you have. So it takes longer to penetrate a deeper, more dense mixture. I, I, have I, a, I don't have I have a part B to the question. Okay. Um, but it's a little on a tangent. Well, why don't okay. we let, Dr. let me go ahead and answer your question back. as far as yeah, the, the tea and coffee. The tea and coffee. Um, I, you know, the, the Chinese believe that a lot of the herbs don't really release their, uh, their benefits until they actually are steeped for a period of time. And so what I would recommend is that you bring the water to a boil, then let it cool for a little bit before you add the, your herbs, and then let it steep until it's warm enough that you're comforted, but not so hot that you would burn your, burn your mouth. Mm -hmm. And um, because really the tissues in your mouth are very delicate, um, but that will allow the most of the beneficial, like with green tea, you know, you're looking for some antioxidant benefits and so forth. Um, that would be. Or some of the mushrooms. Oh, or the mushrooms, mushrooms absolutely. As far as coffee is concerned, um, Water, they, you know, they have a, a water processing that's probably best, but coffee is already roasted, 
So the higher temperature you, um, you brew coffee with, the more acidity it has. That's about all I can say about coffee. But you can, a lot of people now are actually using green, green unroasted coffee and steeping it. Yeah. For the antioxidant value. Now, make this second addendum a little brief. Sure. Um, Superfoods and super herbs. Like um, I just feel the accessibility to this in the United States, it's no surprise, is, uh, in other words, uh, try to get access to, uh, you know, I mean, probably more now than ever, uh, but, you know, like uh, 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 ginkgo, uh, not ginkgo, um, goji berries and maca and some of the, some of the most amazing superfoods in the world. Uh, there's no education system in the United States at that. I think it should be taught at, at like, the, the most important thing when you're a first grade uh, kid is to learn exactly what you're putting into your body. I, I read a uh, study that said 80% of what you're learning is what you're eating. And to be on the standard American diet and having kids on that, I have two kids myself, nine and six, it's just, it's horrendous. So my question is, how do we get access to, like, uh, uh, the government is obviously very, uh, and, and, the, and the FDA is very suppressing of uh, information that will keep you healthy. Uh, so how do, we, how do we get access to, like, superfoods of the world, you know, super uh, herbs, things that are really, really, uh, mm -hmm. that could be very important and, uh, you know, give good, great health as well? Well, unfortunately, a lot of the information that we get are from people who have a vested interest in selling yeah. some of these products. That's and true. I think... You know, I don't really depend on some of the superfoods that a lot of people are are promoting mm -hmm. um, because I think that there are a lot of superfoods that you can buy fresh mm -hmm. that don't have to be transported in, in a, you know, dehydrated at who knows what temperature, um, handled with questionable hygien, hygien, hygienic um, practices, um, sometimes using... Uh, labor in foreign countries where they're you know, getting paid very little. Right. Uh, so those kinds of things are of concern to me, and so I really um, try to utilize fresh produce as much as possible. And uh, I think that you know kale is a superfood, and and um, mm -hmm. blueberries and are superfoods, yeah, and absolutely. so I, I really focus more on those kinds of foods personally. And not everybody can afford to buy these kinds of foods, sure. and I really would like to prepare foods that everybody can make, no matter where they are in the world, that they have access to these foods. And, right. um, and um, so I don't utilize them as much as uh, some people do. Mm -hmm. So maybe Dr. Clement can comment more uh, on that. I'm just going to add briefly to that. I have a colleague in Denmark that searched back, quote, organic goji berries and found out that 93% come from China. They're not organic. Slave labor pretty much is employed on collecting them. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, maca, which people sell as a wonderful food, God forbid you give it to somebody with estrogen active cancers because it's not a great food for those people. So you've got to be very cautious. It, super is a very Americana kind of an idea. You know, That's sort of the way we think of things, big and strong and better and quick and easy and uh, I completely resonate 100% with what Sherry said. You know, the simple things uh, are it, and superior foods rather than superfoods. Yeah, and I also have a concern with the amount of energy that it takes for us to transport these foods. Uh, that's what I was saying. As you, that's what I was as you were saying, and I'm saying the transportation costs and yeah. everything too, and, and packaging, pasteurization and, potentially and all too. That. I mean, it's it's killed by the time it gets here, you know, or it's whitt whittled down in terms of. Once it's picked off the, the leaf or the tree, you know you're, it starts losing energy at that at that point. Yeah. So by right. the time it, by the time it gets here, it's yeah. depleted. Well, the University of California did a study a number of years ago where they took a head of organic lettuce, tested it. Thirty minutes later, fifty-two percent of the nutrients were gone. Thirty-two minutes later, we're not talking about thirty-two days later. And I was stunned. I was in California two years ago, and a trucker said to me, "Who?" His entire job was to truck vegetables. By the time it gets from the West Coast to the East Coast, most of you are consuming vegetables that were picked five to six weeks earlier. I thought it was a week or two. I was shocked when they said that. And another real interesting thing is that they'll, they'll um, 
uh, distributors will hold food while it's in season. They'll store the food uh, until it's no longer in season so that they can get a higher price for it. So it's in cold storage sometimes for months, and then they can sell it as an out-of-season, higher-priced food when really it started losing energy from the moment that it's picked. And so you're paying a high price for food that is less than optimal. So, so we're over here. Yes. I have a health food uh, oriented store or a health oriented store and it's called the water well and I was surprised when I got a bump in my breast that ended up being cancerous and I got a lumpectomy and now I'm doing IV vitamin C and B17 and I was wondering what your opinion is on that. Uh, well, number one, thanks for trying to do the natural things. Uh, in my book, Supplements Exposed, I explain in detail that there is a gigantic disparity between laboratory-created supplements. Absorbic acid, for instance, which most likely you're being given in an IV, is not vitamin C. Uh, when I was writing my book, one of my friends, I asked her to describe it better than I could. Dr. Scarborough said, when you're writing, explain if I gave you an orange and you threw away the orange and ate the skin. That's what taking absorbic acid is like. Now, when you take that into the body in high doses, thousands of units, mm -hmm. what happens is the immune system perceives this as an alien or a foreign substance and attacks it. The last thing somebody with a disease wants is any compromised in immunity. So at Hippocrates, our medical team IVs cassava, which is tapioca. That's where the vitamin C comes from. Now, we can buy it. Others can buy it, but it's significantly more expensive. And I was on Deepak Chopra's show about two years ago, and I love him because he's very smart, and we all just like to listen to him. We don't know what the hell he's talking about, but boy, do we like him. <laughs> do you like what he said? Yes. But what did he say? None of us know. You know. But he's brilliant. The guy's brilliant, no question. And I think he read two of my books in two hours a night before, and he knew more about me than I knew about me. <laughs> and, he's, and he basically said, oh, Dr. Clement, he said, it's interesting. There's only one formula. You say we must get the food from the field and not from the laboratory, but the formula is the same. I said, we made a mistake. We should have had a second formula. I said, we should be smart enough to know that there's nuance, there's subcultures, there's things that we have yet to identify. Remember, the, the, the science of nutrition is very young. It's 1928. Mm -hmm. We began it. We got it running by 1970. And now we're probably in kindergarten level with this. So the reality is you need whole foods. And even if we have yet to discover the benefits, the nuance, the subcultures, you'll get them. And someday we can explain why that worked and the other can be harmful. As far as B17, they heat it to three to 400 degrees. It's abscisic acid is the chemical name of it. I'd much rather see you eat drink wheatgrass, has riddled with it. At one point when I joined the staff, we used to think that's what helped the cancer. Now we realize that it has numerous phytonutrients in it. Uh, apricot seeds mm -hmm. uh, have enormous amounts in, but not 300 to 400 degrees heated, uh, extracted, you know, B17. And one of the things I think have happened in the alternative field, we keep doing the same old, same old, same old, because it's been done, rather than say, hey, let's try to look for new things. Mm -hmm. So congratulations doing the right thing. Thanks for being here. And whatever I can do to help you, let me know. That will go away once you're happy about being alive. Wow. I'm coming to you in February. Oh, great. <laughs> Good. Thank you. One, okay. One other thing. Um, there's a growing consensus among breast oncologists that a large number of lumps and bumps previously called cancer are actually not or their precancer, or the ductal carcinoma in situ is not necessarily a cancer at all. So I don't want to invade your privacy and talk about that here. We can talk later. But a lot of women have been treated for cancer who did not have cancer. Mm -hmm. And we overtreat cancer. Um, and that's a whole other ballgame. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's, it's the most important thing that was said here, mm -hmm. she just said. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> a quick thank you to Brian Clement for teaching me almost all this stuff in 2005, um, eight years ago, and uh, where I went back and I like fought with my relatives about them growing GMOs and basically almost had to cut off some relationships because I just didn't know how to handle it and talk about it with them. 
So to have you talk and speak and learn the facts and learn the compassion of my relatives, um, learn that they're victims too, believing Monsanto, that the farmers are also victims and now they're stuck. And to also learn that there's going to be, and I would, I'm going to be part of that, learning how to change what they're doing and make their land sustainable again uh, is invaluable. So thank you for that. I don't necessarily have a question unless you'd like to say something about that. I would. I It's easy to tell stories to get people angry at Monsanto. <laughs> I, I could do that all day, and I have. <laughs> but I don't want to personally get angry at individuals. I don't want to pick fights with individuals. In fact, uh, I remember when I went to the WTO conference in uh, Cancun and met one of the people that is clearly on the other side, and I was totally friendly and happy and whatnot. And then I met one of his colleagues a couple of years later, and he said, oh, you're the friendly one. So they passed around the word that I'm the friendly one. I, I feel like, uh, first of all, as Dever said, there, there are people who have been convinced. There are liars somewhere. But I don't want to assume that whoever I'm talking to is a liar. I, I, they, the people I'm talking to are convinced that Monsanto is right. Maybe the lied to, the victim. Now, there are people that made an entire website attacking my book, and there they spent months and months and months formulating a, you know, ways to try and use junk science against my, my book, Genetic Roulette, and they misquote my book. So I know that they're lying. So I can say, ah, these guys are liars. But it's very rare that you can look at someone and say, ah, they know the truth, they're covering it up. And even if they cover it up, sometimes it's not for money, sometimes they're ideologues who believe this is so important, we need to, we need to protect people from the truth so that they go with the greater good. Um, there's an element in all of this which is a spiritual angle, which is that these guys have a, a manipulative energy and a very divisive energy, and if we come down to their level, even with the truth, we know the truth, but we somehow get sucked into their level, then we've lost on a spiritual level. We've lost on a, on a heart level. And it's like we, we know the world we want to create. We want to create a healthy world. We want to create a world full of love, a world with happiness, friendliness. And so I had a, a, a very interesting conversation with a guy that blogs for Forbes totally against me, just picks, you know, picks on me. We had like five conversations. We totally enjoyed each other's conversation. He wrote down, I have to say that I enjoy, I enjoy Mr. Smith. I enjoy his, his conversations. But he's bizarre in his thinking. Well, no, he's, he's paid. But... <laughs> So I just wanted to put that out, that uh, it's like, and another thing, you know, you go out to restaurants and you find, okay, you're trying to avoid, avoid soybean oil or canola oil, and you find out it's everywhere. And the people say, no, 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 we use vegetable oil. No, no, vegetable oil is soybean oil. And they, you want to get angry because you can't eat your favorite food anymore. And so you can get angry at the waitress and at the waiter <laughs> and at the restaurant. You can get angry at Whole Foods because some of the things they sell are GMO laden. It's like, that's another stress. And at the same time, I say to people, if you accidentally or you can't afford, you can't avoid GMOs, don't worry about it. Because worrying is toxic. And now you have two toxins, the GMO and worry. <laughs> so it's like, there's a whole nother way to deal with all of these shoulds, do's, and don'ts. And that is with great compassion for ourselves and with others. I wanted to make that clear. Thank Amen. You. <laughs> Thank you. Can I bring up one more thing, Deborah, um, about the um, cell phones that are noise? Um, oh, the white noise. noise, yeah. Right, right, for, right. For, for um, we're actually... 
hopefully uh, with Hippocrates, I haven't proposed this to Bryant yet, but we're actually going to have a contest, a global contest for the most foolish use of a cell phone. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> and and it can, can be global. And one of the, the one, and we may have one winner every month, but I'll give you a couple. One of them is a phone that plays white noise that you put under the baby's head to get the baby to go to sleep. Another of them, I'm not making this up, and you know this, is a phone app that you program mommy's voice so that when the baby moves or cries, the phone says, shh, it's okay now, sweetheart, back to sleep. You can program a phone so that you can put it underneath the baby. This is not a good idea on so many levels. I don't know where to begin, starting with the fact that I now, as a grandmother, can tell you, my daughter just had a lovely, beautiful, perfect child, <laughs> and I can still remember when she was a baby. And you know your period of babyhood with your child is so limited. The idea that they're giving it up to cell phones and wireless devices uh, is just really sad. So all of these are foolish uses, and nobody can imagine the long-term impact. But as I showed in my talk that some of you did not see, the brain of a baby doubles, more than doubles in the first year of life. The skull of a child is thinner. The brain is going very fast. And therefore, we protect children greatly because we know that that's the most vulnerable time of life. Prenatally, when the brain starts to grow in the first trimester, there's nothing protecting it at all. It's just a bunch of cells. By the second and third trimester, there's the thinnest little skeleton growing around it. And babies' heads are very thin and soft. That's why when you drop them, which happens sometimes, they don't break uh, because the skulls actually aren't completely full uh, together. And we have to protect our young children for sure. And there are many foolish uses of phones. And we could have a global contest because some countries have stranger uses even, even than that. Deborah, I would like to suggest something. Um, the iPhone app store has criteria for which apps they take. Uh -huh. So maybe you want to propose to them to never approve apps, for example, that you strap on a pregnant woman to monitor the baby over a long time, but you, that you never approve something that's, that's placed you know, specifically around the head of a baby, and that that actually becomes their, their criteria. Same with the Android. And so we, can, we, can, we can't eliminate the use of you know, cell phones in those cases, but you can certainly eliminate approval of apps that could be used that are designed specifically right. in those crazy ways. Right. I, uh, we are in the pro we've started those conversations with Silicon Valley. I have a talk I'm giving um, in a month there uh, to the Silicon Valley Health Institute. So they want to know about these things, and I will let you know if we how far we get on it. Uh, but I'll tell you one story. Steve Jobs, uh, in the six months before he died, personally rejected an app for the iPhone called TalkOn, T-A-W-K-O-N. If you don't have an iPhone, you can get it. What TalkOn does is it has an algorithm in the phone, and it tells you when you have the phone too close to yourself or when the phone is giving you too much radiation. It exists. It was developed, of course, by Israelis. And uh, the, there's another company called uh, Green Swan that has something that they sell as well. And they, again, Apple will not sell it. Could you repeat both of these? Yes, things? sir. TalkOn is T-A-W-K-O-N. And the other company is Green Swan. And there's actually, and there's another company called Pong Research. And they all make devices that actually do have the effect of either telling you when there's too much radiation, or in the Pong case, it actually reduces the amount of radiation absorbed into your body. So these things do exist. We would like to see them standard. We would, why shouldn't all phones have lights that flash when the phone is, is giving you more radiation? Why not? I mean, again, we need girl cots. You got it. You know, we need people to say we want the right to purchase safer phones and wireless devices. We want devices that automatically turn themselves down when they get too close to somebody and the radiation is too high. Right? There are proximity sensors in the iPad. 
I'm not sure quite how they work, but they had to do that because the iPad is too hot otherwise. Hmm. It's very hot. And then could you? Yep. I'm, I'm jumping in. Can you address some of the phones are, somebody told me, and I don't know this to be true or not, Samsung puts less radioactivity out than iPhone. You know anything about that? Yeah, it's true. Samsung phones measure that they emit less microwave radiation, and it's microwave radiation. It's not radioactivity like from the X-ray or the comet or the cobalt, you know, the stuff that's out there in outer space. It's not that. It's non-ionizing, but it is microwave radiation. And the Samsung phones generally test with much lower amounts of radiation coming from them than the iPhone. Okay, you, if you have an iPhone, you know how your battery's always running down? Right. Well, guess what? Half of that battery is going right into your body. When you keep that phone in your pocket, how many of you were not here when I went through the safety warning on the iPhone? How many were not here? So most people saw that warning. Buried inside your phone, there is a warning, and it tells you that if you keep the phone in your pocket, you can exceed the as-tested exposure guidelines. And no one's ever filed any lawsuits against me for telling people this. It is the truth. It's in the phone. And the interesting thing on preemption is that the San Francisco uh, passed a law saying you had a right to know about cell phone safety radiation, specifically about this, this fact. And they were defeated by the cell phone industry that spent millions of dollars because the industry argued, and I'm not making this up, we can tell you buried inside our phone about how to use the phone safely, but you, San Francisco, cannot compel us to tell you before you buy the phone at the store where you're going to buy it, because that's compelled speech under the First Amendment. And they won. And they won. Right. Okay. Thank you Here very we much. Are. Okay. Hi. This is also on the same topic, and Dr. Davis, you asked me to bring it up at the mic. So to, to expand on radiation, I was asking, what do we do in our apartment? I could turn my wireless router down, I could turn my cell phone off, but what do I do about the circuit breakers and the transformers and the um, adjoining wall to my neighbor who might have some equipment on that wall, how do I protect myself? And uh, repeaters on the buildings, what do you suggest? Okay. Well, the first thing is you've got you to know your neighbor, really. It's, it's a good idea, and you have to ask them, where do you keep your router? I think that this is, we've got to really start to think about our ac access to that information. We have these cards which we're going to work with Hippocrates to make available from websites. This says, do it with wires, practice safe phone. Practice safe tech. Practice safe tech, practice safe phone. The idea being, we want to promote this sort of safety. So for yourself, of course, distance is your friend, but beware of weak signals, because when the signal is weak, the device has to work harder and it's going to put more radiation into you. As to your home environment, generally, don't sleep with your phone on, on your body, don't have a router near you when you're sleeping, or don't have it in the area where people spend a lot of time. In our house, it's in a closet, right, where nobody goes very often except when we can't find something. Uh, sorry? A few feet, okay? And, and when you use your phone, you know, it's best to just have it on a desk, in front of you. You don't need to have it on your body. And um, this little device here is one of those that works pretty well so that you can actually hear. And they're fun. You know, and, it's li and this is actually lightweight. It plugs into most phones. You, you can actually hear with it. You can get them online. Who, um, who was that comedian that used to talk on the phone? Maxwell Smart. Yes. Oh, absolutely. No, no. The, yes, yes, yes. He had a shoe phone. Yes. Do you know? Oh, there's a great line. He had a shoe phone, and um, these are inexpensive. And these are these are very inexpensive. But his phone was actually an actual shoe. Do you remember right. that? And he had a hard time making getaways because he had a shoe phone. If he was on the shoe phone, he couldn't he couldn't um, get get away very fast. But there was one incredibly funny um, gig that he did, um, where he was um, making a call. And the operator, with, with his shoe, 
So you have to imagine that he had a shoe, <laughs> right, like this, and in the and in the shoe, it was the phone, right? And he's <laughs> right, and so he's making a call with the shoe phone, and I've got to. I've got to find this because it was just um, pretty funny. And, and the operator says, hello. And he says, operator, I need to make a call to someone. She said, that'll be 20 cents. He said, operator, this is a shoe phone. She says, that'll be 25 cents. <laughs> he says, operator, there's no way in the shoe phone that I can give you a deposit. She said, sorry, we can't, take, we can't make collect calls with shoe phones. And this was real, you know, the, and so that, that gig that was for, from the 1970s, okay, at the time, people thought the idea of a mobile phone was a joke. And the first mobile phone was developed by Motorola as a contest uh, with AT&T, and they won. And why didn't phones take off in the 1970s? Because we didn't have towers. So in 1996, my administration with President Clinton passed the Telecommunications Act that made it illegal for anyone to raise a health concern about where a tower is located. It is against federal law. States and localities cannot preempt federal law, and you can put a tower anywhere you want in the United States. I was just on the line with India this morning they have laws in India about where towers can be located. We don't. Right. Oh, boy. Yeah. So the answer, in to your, I'm sorry, in your home is this. Distance is your friend. You can unplug, and it's okay to do so. All right? And you can turn things off. Um, there's a difference between the electromagnetic radiation that, that powering the lights here, which is 60 hertz a second, that's 60 cycles a second, and that which is powering a cell phone, which is 2.4 billion cycles a second. So they are different, all right? Cells are 75 hertz. And the, the question of how much radiation they give, it's not the power of the radiation, it's the resonance, and it's the disruptive signal that goes And as I showed in my talk, there's a radical change over a short period of time in the signal, and it's that change over time that we think is more biologically important than the very weak power of the phone. Phones are weak in power. And some people argued that therefore they need, needed no safety testing, and they have never been tested for safety. But in fact, the absence of evidence of safety really is not proof of harm, but it's not proof of safety either. Boy, we could have another. You want to continue this for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday? <laughs> then we'll think about Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Maybe we'll just move in here. Yes. Um, I, thank you. I want to thank you all. You're fabulous. Um, Dr. Davis, I love my electric blanket. <laughs> oh, <laughs> if I warm the blanket and then turn it off, turn it off before you go in, is that cool? That's fine. Let me tell you something else. This is very interesting. There were some studies, I think in the 70s, about some of the hazards of electric blankets. And the electric blanket company re-engineered electric blankets. So today's electric blankets are much safer. It wasn't a girl caught. It was the industry realizing that they were going to get in trouble. I'll tell you two facts, two facts that most people don't know that immediately make them think. In case you're talking to somebody about cell phones and they say, what are you talking about? They have to be safe. Everything's fine. Well, the two facts are these. Number one, most phones come with warnings inside the phone, and it tells you, do not hold closer than an inch to your body or something like that. That's number one. The phones themselves give you warnings inside the phone. It used to be in fine print that nobody read, but now you actually, most phones come with some warning about safe distance. Number two, you cannot buy insurance for damages for health risks from cell phones from secondary insurance companies like Swiss Re and Lloyd's of London. The secondary insurance industry will not write to protect companies from health damages from cell phones. That's a very powerful indication. Something is going on there. 
And in specific, Swiss Re recently wrote about why they wouldn't write these policies, specifically referring to asbestos as something they did not want to go through again on cell phones. So that's telling you something in the business world, right? Now, I have great confidence in American industry and ingenuity, and I know we can design safer phones, safer hardware, and safer software. You know, these devices are very valuable. They, they save people's lives. We all hear the stories. And even in 9-11, in, in they left poignant opportunities for people to leave calls and speak to loved ones they might never hear from again. So I'm not opposed to phones. I just want to make them as safe as possible. As I said before, it's like cars and airbags and seat belts. We can put the equivalent of airbags and seat belts on these devices and on how towers are located. And I think, and we're making some progress. We just need to make it faster. Right? So our so, electric blankets safe to leave on? Today, what I, thank you for sharing. I, what I would do is I would turn it on because it's cold at night. I also recommend a warm bath with lavender oil. It's a very good way to relax and, and it gives you another Young health, boyfriend. you know, health <laughs> benefits. But, you know, if you don't want to go the old-fashioned route of a hot water bottle, then um, uh, it using, it the, using it to warm up your bed and turning it off is fine. And I do believe, though, that if, if some people have some conditions, there are some conditions where you might need to keep it warm at night, it is, they are a lot safer now than they were 30 years ago when people were expressing concerns about that wiring. Right. right. And look, the perfect is the enemy of the good, okay? For all of these things, including, I may say, when you eat your melons and the fruits and the vegetables and trying to keep it all straight, which is hard. You can go crazy. You can go, don't go crazy. Just try. A, trying to do something a little bit better is better than try, giving it all up. Okay, thank and, you. and I have to give a plug to hot water bottles because I've been using hot water bottles for decades. I love my hot water bottle. I even travel with a hot water oh, bottle. Oh, really? Yeah. Absolutely. Dan has his and I have mine. I'm not, I don't want his cold feet on me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to inflict that on him either. But hot water bottles are fabulous. Thank you. I, I do have one question, too, for Mr. Smith about the corn. During the summer, my husband loves to go to the farm stand and buy corn. You know, you see all the farmers mm -hmm. harvesting mm -hmm. the corn. And I never thought about the GMOs, and I don't know how much of the corn, local corn, is GMO. So before we start buying corn, we should go talk to the farmer and say, where would you get your corn from? Where would you yeah. get your seeds from? Yeah, talk to the farmer. They'll know if they're using genetically engineered corn varieties. There are two companies that make... Uh, sweet corn, Syngenta and Monsanto, and the Monsanto has three, three genes in it, two producing Bt toxin and one withstanding herbicide. So the corn is going to actually be drenched in Roundup and produce a toxin that pokes holes in cells. So the sweet corn from Monsanto may be the most dangerous of all the GM crops because it's not processed at all. You get the full impact. So the, the grower should know. Now, 88% of all corn in the U.S. is genetically engineered, but a smaller percentage of the sweet corn is genetically engineered. Uh, there's no blue corn or red corn that's GMO, but sometimes the blue corn chips are contaminated with GM, white corn, or, or yellow corn. No popcorn is genetically engineered. I'll say that again, and this time applaud. No popcorn is genetically engineered. No popcorn. Yes. It does not even cross-pollinate with field corn, so it is always pure for the time being. Just don't cook it in genetically engineered vegetable oil. <laughs> when they tried to genetically engineer popcorn, it imploded and disappeared. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, I have two questions. The first one is, can you tell me a treatment that would work on musculoskeletal injuries that cause nerve damage? Is there something, like, I know the infrared works well, but is there? Uh, you have to go into the, the uh, significantly advanced forms of cold lasers. These are things we use at the Institute. Uh, also, state-of-the-art in electromagnetic frequencies. Now, the only thing they'll allow that to be approved for in this country is post-operative healing and bone fractures. So it's exactly what you want. And neurological concerns can actually be uh, extensively 
expedited in recovery from the use of those two things. Acupuncture in and of itself, a little bit more primitive, a little bit slower. Body work, where people are actually moving circulatory blood through the body, that can be helpful. But right at the top of the list is cold laser electromagnetic therapies. Excellent. And and the second question is, um, someone that does not convert their beta carotene to vitamin A um, and they want to go on a plant-based live food um, diet, what do you suggest they do? Uh, very much take the forms that you would get out of sea vegetables because that's already converted over. So if you took dulse as an example, and what's interesting, how many of you have brought your children up this way? Well, it's just stunning that I have never met a child who doesn't gravitate towards dulse. It's almost remarkable. Uh, Ann Wigmore, who was just so simple and so beautiful in many ways, said, I said, how did you learn this stuff? And knowing that she had no formal understanding of it, she said, I would put babies, my friends' babies, and chickens into a room, put different things around, and see what they gravitated towards most of the time. I said, that is so simple, but obviously it was effective. <laughs> so these are the things we, we've learned. Dulce. Never went for the chickens. <laughs> exactly. The children never went for the chickens. I never thought of that. Did the chickens and children go to the room together? <laughs> Thank you. There's, there's plenty of evidence that chickens, as well as in terms of avoiding GMOs when given a choice, where there's GMOs and non-GMOs, cows, pigs, geese, squirrels, elk, deer, raccoons, rats, mice, chickens, dogs, buffalo, have all been shown to avoid eating GMOs when given a choice. Yeah, it's not always the case, but yeah, it it's, it's happens all over the planet. You've got to be careful because dogs like chocolate, too. <laughs> you know, you want to be careful with that. Okay. Some of you know me. My name is John Eagle. <clears throat> I want to thank Steve. Steve, you've done a wonderful job. I want to thank the panel. Uh, I want to tell you just a brief story here. Um, at an early age, I took state championship in chess in Illinois. We have to know what our competition is doing, our opponent. And each one of you have done a wonderful job. Hippocrates, six decades. The rest of the panel, I know that there's decades with Jeffrey. And each of the other ones, I'm not, I don't know that well. But I know one thing. What's happening to our bee supply? They're being killed off. If your bee supply is killed off, and nobody mentioned bees, but if a bee supply is killed off, where is our food coming from? We need to understand that the, uh, uh, Monsanto is buying up. They've bought up over 5,000 seed companies, and now it's illegal for you to process seed on your own farm unless you have a million-dollar facility. So this being said, we don't have a lot of time. And I want to put an urgency on this. If you look at this audience, you're preaching to the choir. You don't have obesity that much in this audience. Uh, you have intelligent people. You, you don't only have maybe 300 here. I propose that we go to Madison Square Garden for a week, six days, free. Anyone in this audience here, if they had friends that had an economical problem, maybe they would be here. We have to get this message out to the masses if we're going to stop. We have to, def we have to defend our rights as citizens of the world to say enough is enough, and we need to get to the people that need to know the message. That's the religious community. So I propose that anyone that wants to join us in Madison Square Garden, step up, because there's plenty of room, because it's free. Thanks a lot. That's good. Thank you. I have, John, John, I have a thought about that. Um, you know, the world is different now. And having one big, wonderful love fest in Madison Square Garden sounds like a great idea. But in order to give it legs, so to speak, you really need to work with the current social media to extend this in the churches as well. There are churches, by the way, that are encouraging people to come to services with their iPads. I'm not making this up so that they can look at different things while they're in church. Now, I actually think that my spiritual experience is such that I wouldn't really like to be having a computer in front of my face while I'm trying to think thoughts of connecting to what's holy. But we can take advantage of some of these new techniques to extend the reach. So you might have a meeting in Madison Square Garden, but you want to make sure that you get a bunch of people who are probably under 20 who know how to reach their peers with the kind of information that we have here because it's the young generation that we've got to reach, and we've got to use the tools that they are using now to reach them. That's Absolutely, all. and I want to say thank you for that uh, additional information, but I want to say this. 
Dr. Oz gets a full audience. Joel Steen gets a full audience. Now, there's a man that wrote a book, Purpose Driven Life, Rick Warren, Saddleback Church. There are people out there that can fill the stadium by themselves. Um, you mentioned some of my favorite speakers. We can get uh, Dr. T. Colin Campbell, uh, and, and, but people discredit him. We need to stand together and stand united, because united we stand and divided we fall. But we have to put an urgency on this, and, and I, I want to ask one question. Anybody in this audience, if this, was, if this assembly was free, how many more people you think would be here? Raise your hand to see. I want to see a sign of hands. Not that many. Then we're preaching to the wrong uh, choir. We need to be united on this. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. Uh, John mentioned some things that I'm not congruent with. Are these factual statements that if you don't have a million dollar facility on your farm, it's illegal to process your own seeds now? I have not heard that. Uh, I have heard that uh, Monsanto has been hassling and suing and uh, the seed cleaners in the, in the uh, soy side. You see, they want to eliminate seed saving and replanting. And so they, people sign up when they get the genetically engineered seeds that they're not allowed to save their seeds. Well, if they're going to save their seeds, there's a, a group that, that cleans seeds to prepare for that. So they are, they've sued the seed cleaners saying that sometimes the seed cleaners will be cleaning seeds that are genetically engineered and therefore illegally being saved. And they've tried to put seed cleaners out of business. Is, is this, this also part of the Terminator seeds? What Terminator's uh, seeds are not yet commercialized. Uh, no, the Bra Brazil is going to be voting on it in a month. Uh, Terminator seeds are those seeds that you plant where they do not... They produce sterile offspring. You can't plant the seeds. You see, they want to do that so they don't have to do it through legal means. Right now, if you, if you buy, you're not allowed to replant, and if you do, they can sue you. If they think you do, they can send you a letter saying, send us $100,000, $150,000, and we may not sue you. They have actually collected close to $300 million that we know about, mm. and then when the, the farmer agrees to pay, they sign a contract that they can't discuss any aspects of the settlement. So it's, it's, and sometimes the farmers never planted GMOs. In fact, they never planted and never wanted GMOs. And some farmers plant GMOs now because they're too scared of being sued if they don't plant. It's bizarre. It's well, an absolute nightmare out there. I was on a, a conference tour of Oregon recently, and they showed me that these companies were in Oregon, which is southern Oregon, riddled with organic farmers. And they were selectively buying up farms, doubling the price they're worth, handing it to the people, and intentionally putting in genetic modified uh, crops, and then reporting, once it started to spread pollen, reporting these people so they no longer have certification under USDA for organic. Are you aware of this? They showed me the maps on this. In Jackson County, Oregon, they're going to have a ballot initiative in the fall to create a GM-free zone. I did speak there last year, and they found that Syngenta had planted, I believe it was uh, sugar beets, uh, which can cross with chard and other beets, and someone who was planting organic had to plow his, his field under because he realized he was at risk to be uh, Contaminated. So this was intentional. Uh, I can't speak to the intention. I, I know that they that they did it. I don't know if it's they did it for cross contamination on purpose or simply to grow out field trials. I don't know. Okay, but well, suspicious uh, anyway. We I, we live in Mendocino County and we've been GM free for I don't know how long, a really long time. Um, <laughs> how how many how many counties have taken those kinds of steps? The grassroots steps of of voting to be GMO free? Well, Mendocino was the first, and it was Measure H, and the biotech industry called it the H bomb. <laughs> and so they went ahead and they talked to the state legislatures around the country, and in about 14 states, preempted the rights of local counties and cities to declare themselves as non GMO. So some states can't do that. Uh, in California, 
Marin County and Mendocino have passed ballot initiatives to ban GM planting. County councils have banned GMOs in Santa Cruz and uh, Trinity County. Uh, this year, or last year, Hawaii County banned it on the Big Island. Uh, last year, San, San Juan Islands, San Juan Islands San Juan. in Washington passed a ballot initiative yeah. to ban it. Uh, there is a town in Maine that banned GMOs, and yeah, one in, in Maine, you know, East Coast, yeah. <laughs> Finally, <laughs> and, what happened uh, in New York? Yeah, so uh, now there's a big focus on labeling. So there is a there is a law, a bill in the House in uh, in New York State for labeling GMOs. There's going to be a hearing, and there's 15 members of the hearing of the legislature that are in the committee, and they're going to make a vote. And uh, it'll be very important for people to put their, especially if you live in the area where your representative is on that committee to put their phone number in your speed dial. And at a certain point, you'll just sign up out at our table at the very end on the left, can connect with those folks, because there'll be an opportunity for you to have some influence. Because last year, the committee voted against it, and it never went to the, to the floor. So uh, we could have labeling in New York. In fact, Connecticut passed a labeling bill, and Maine passed a labeling bill, but both bills require two other states at a minimum, to pass a similar bill before they're enacted. And the states have to have a total population of at least 20 million. New York has, I think, 19 million. So New York passes, and one other passes, oh, and yeah. then it, all of New England goes. <clears throat> and as New England goes, the rest of the country goes. That's Is that how right. it goes? Is that how it goes? <laughs> See, in his past life, he was in the Revolutionary War, this fellow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, was, uh, I had the privilege to sit with a parliament or whatever the equivalent is in Ireland a decade ago and challenge them uh, to eliminate GMO and to go organic. And sadly, you had half of them that was completely enlightened and wonderful, and the other half, they couldn't wait to get out to the pub. Now, who's here from Maine right now? Here we are. Look at these Mainers. Okay. All we right. need you. It's as Maine goes, so goes the nation. On Monday, tomorrow... Uh, I believe, the Maine legislature will take up a bill by Andrea Boland uh, that proposes that warnings be mandatory for all cell phones sold in the state of Maine, of Maine on the box. And the warning would say, warning, this device is a two-way microwave radio that can increase your risk of cancer. I think the word is that, that may. So please contact your representative in the state of Maine and make sure that they are aware of that this is a very important thing because the phrase was, as Maine goes, so goes the nation. Mm -hmm. And maybe, the, and this is a start because just as you were ticking off the counties, we have had similar efforts to try to issue warnings at the state and county level. Mm -hmm. uh, and Teton County, my home county in Jackson, Wyoming, has uh, passed a cell phone awareness um, statute in 2010 and we have a program at Teton County we've handed out more than 25,000 cell phone safety cards and the county has is is uh, taking a very serious campaign now not to text and drive but also to make children and parents and clinics are handing out our safety cards as well our safety card which you got some of at the conference and I'm sure that Hippocrates will make them available through those who want them as well has been handed out, I think, 1.5 million copies in seven languages, Turkish, Finnish, Spanish, Eng English, of, of course. And we're always looking for partners who want to help us get the message out, and particularly to reach teachers who can, uh, therefore, influence parents and students as well. Okay. So, yeah. Hi. Uh, well, my question is really a multiple set of questions combined into one overall <laughs> point. <laughs> so uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, maybe. Um, my, the, the, over, the umbrella question is, what do you see as the dangers of what I will uh, ask you about and what might be some of the solutions? Because I see them all as being unified here. Number one, what is happening with radioactivity being leaked into the ocean and coming to our shores, into our food supply from Fukushima? 
Number two, chemtrails that, according to my research, are uh, filling the atmosphere and, and the stuff comes down into, this, into the soil, into our crops, etc. Aluminum, barium, strontium, pharmaceutical stuff, I don't need, even know what it is. All this stuff is, and, and we breathe this, and it relates to, uh, allegedly, from what I've read, Morgellons, which is these nano-microfibers that seem to be um, uh, synthetically engineered. We breathe them. They're coming into our food supply. And there's an electromagnetic uh, a magnetic effect that has been reported to somehow activate these things. I don't know. This is what I read. And the third issue, which is part of this whole thing, is Obamacare. Obamacare specifically in terms of its provision for the, uh, I think it's called the Independent Advisory Review Board. Uh, these 15 or so administrators who are going to have total control over what medications and treatments we as Americans will be allowed to receive or be denied, regardless of what our personal doctors might think. So any of these issues, um, I throw them all or aspects of them open to your comments. Well, I'll, I'll start and try to be concise, and then we'll pass the mic down uh, for the sake of time. Uh, number one, you have to understand that just because we had a spill in Japan, that shouldn't be your larger concern. Uh, during the, the first Gulf War, we started to intentionally put uh, radioactive waste on warheads. The second Gulf War, Iraq, as well as Afghanistan, this is con constantly being done. And I didn't only read about it and know it since I w didn't go to the war fields. Uh, I talked to a sergeant who was trained in Afghanistan to handle the material. Much larger concern, depleted uranium. Uh, much larger the concern than what happened. Not to say that's not a concern, not to say that's not a big concern in Hawaii, because I have a colleague that's monitoring that and said it's outrageous. They just started last week or the week before the third reactor. Now the, the rates have gone dramatically up again. So this is real. As far as seeding the atmosphere, now I would like to believe, since I'm a happy guy, uh, that this is being done to retard or to at least reduce the proton rays coming from the sun because the powers that be know how severe this heating of the planet is at this point. And I would like to believe that. There are other people who think it's more sinister in scheme, but your planet is being seeded, that they're putting heavy metal particulate in the atmosphere, and this is not a possibility. There's a documentary that will show you. They go globally. They test soil. They show you the same uh, things that you mentioned are in there. And the barium, you know, the uh, strontium. And when you start to see this universally in Paris and in Mount Shasta and everywhere, obviously it's happening. Now, if somebody can answer why that's happening, I don't know. I hope it's more optimistic. As far as Obamacare, I think all of you would have been very pleased with what the initial idea was. Uh, Obama was elected. Uh, two weeks later, the vice president's brother came to visit me. We had two or one subsequent. Uh, they were going to tax soda out of existence because they realized what fr high fructose corn here. They were going to make it so that you almost had to write on the front of a fast food restaurant exactly how dangerous it was to eat those foods. They were optimistic, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, young, you know, uh, dreamers and naive. And what happened is it got in there, and the powers that be, uh, the corporations that sell soda pop, you may remember if you're a little awake, the ads that went there uh, came after them, and the insurance industries came after them, and the very people today you hear yelling about Obamacare literally were people who prostituted the law and made it as bad as it is today. And that's a fact. It's not an opinion. If you really look at history, that's what it is. We, we've ended up with a law that's certainly far from perfect. It's imperfect. But I, as an American, I think it's a good idea to make sure every American is covered by insurance. So let's give some honor to that. We're the only nation in the world. We claim we're the richest nation, the most compassionate nation. I think we are the richest nation, but I know we're not any longer the most compassionate nation. 
If you get sick, get on a plane and get your ass to Paris. They have by far the best health care system on the planet Earth. Don't listen to the talking heads that tell you how great our health care system is, because it's rated at 57 on the planet. What America should be proud of is our emergency care, trauma care. We lead the world in trauma care. Every other bit of care, we should be ashamed. Countries that have zero budget, no health care system, are way ahead of us in 30 and 40, and we're 57. So let's not listen to the media. The media manipulates your mind. You don't even know the media is manipulating your mind. And if you want news, don't listen to American news anymore. When I'm out of the United States, which I am a handsome amount of time, I learn more about my country, frankly, than I do here in the United States. And there's not a liberal media and a conservative media. There's a controlled media, and the boss happens to be corporate interest. That's it. Well, I can't speak to all of these things, but, but let me see if I remember the very first question. I need a little help here. Um, yes. Fukushima, Fukushima chemtrails. Okay. The Navy um, is um, confirming that the sailors that were first sent in to Fukushima are now coming down with very high rates of thyroid and other cancers. They went in a, as a you know, man, humanitarian mission, and they're bearing the price. The, immediate, the results of Fukushima will be felt years from now, just as the results of Chernobyl have been. Chernobyl involved several hundred Hiroshima's in terms of the radiation release. And uh, at this point, I think that it is a global problem because the, the pollution will spread globally. Uh, and I am concerned about Hawaii and the air in Hawaii and Northern California, your area. Um, could well show and has shown areas of, of higher radioactivity. Um, I think, um, but the, bar the larger issue is that we do not have a plan for dealing with nuclear waste anywhere in the world that's successful. And, and that's, a, you know, nuclear power is a great idea in theory if it could only be shown to work in practice. <laughs> and we've had so many examples where it simply hasn't worked well. And we are so lucky that we didn't end up in the situation of having to evacuate uh, Tokyo because we came very close to needing to do that with what happened there. Now, I've read some uh, investigator comments that say that that actually should be done and will need to be done. Well, the, the zones that should be uninhabitable are certainly larger than, uh, than, they are, you know, than they are right now. About chemtrails, I've heard the following innocent explanation, and I will share it with you. Jet fuel, hydrazine, contains heavy metals. It contains a lot of the things that are byproducts of incomplete combustion, which is what chemtrails may be. Now, there are studies that have been done with deliberate release in order to monitor the movement of clouds in the ionosphere and in the stratosphere. And there's the tropopause, because I was on the group that studied climate patterns, which is in between the stratosphere and the troposphere, all right? And in order to study that, there have been a few examples of deliberate release of tracer things of different colors, et cetera. Okay, that's done. Uh, but that does not necessarily mean that every day some great global conspiracy is up there releasing this stuff, although I know a lot of people have concerns about it. it the explanation could be something as relatively innocent as jet traffic which has grown exponentially. And as that has grown, one of the most polluted places in the world to live is in the plume underneath airports. Because as jets take off, they release a tremendous amount of stuff. And the same thing, as, as, and as they land, they release less because their loads are less. Okay. So, so that's a possibility. I'm not prepared to discuss it or argue it. I'm simply saying that could be an explanation. Let's hope that's All right, yes. That, and then finally, as, as to, you know, Obamacare, I think, you know, this is a very, very difficult situation we face as a nation because we are the only modern nation in the world to deny health care to people as a human right. We are the only industrial nation in the world. And we can talk all about slave labor in China and things like that. But in China, there is a modicum. Now, I'm not advocating Chinese health care, but don't get me wrong. <laughs> but, but we really 
have to figure out a solution to this problem. And what has happened is exactly what Brian said. It started out with Nobel ideas. We were actually going to have the tax on soda fund a lot of this stuff. There was a proposal for what we call sin taxes, taxing all the bads, alcohol, tobacco, sodas, pharmaceuticals were going to get a heavier tax. And that fee, they were going to call it, was going to be used to fund a lot of this stuff. But no, no, there was no, it had to be revenue neutral. Now, why it had to be net revenue neutral, I don't know. Because I think that actually making people pay more to drink alcohol and smoke tobacco makes a lot of sense. I really do. And yes, and the same thing should be for these guzzling sodas that are just so poisonous. High fructose corn syrup, do you know how much sugar is in a Coke? And do you know why? They figured out you could put as much sugar into Coke as would make it still be a liquid without turning it into candy. That's how much sugar. The maximum saturation of this fructose uh, in, in it. And so I think that we all, we, as a country, we need to lower the rhetoric and talk about what we need to do together to address the fact that we still have poor children who can't get health care. Can, can I just add a, 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 a very short observation, but I do want to hear the rest of your uh, responses, about chemtrails. I'm not an expert, but I've done a lot of online research, and looked right. at a lot of YouTube things, and have also in Stockholm where I live some of the time and in New York City where I live much of the time, I have seen almost every day, not every day, but almost every day, crisscrosses and loop-de-loops of trails going across the sky and over time they spread out like large feathers and gray the area. These are not, from my understanding, jet, normal jet trails yeah. of planes taking well, off. Dr. Dr. Davis didn't deny this. She just said she didn't know about well, it. Well, yes, I understand. And she, like me, really, really, really hope that there's an optimistic thing going on here. I we hope just hope to too. God it's not gone to that level of insanity now. We have about five minutes left, so if we want to speak, try to make it quick so we can get one or two questions in. Yeah, they, the, the other no, that's what I mean. We have a total of five minutes. Okay, here you go. I don't have knowledge to talk directly about any of those, but I do know the things that I do control is what I do to make my system as strong as possible in what I eat and how I believe. And so... I applaud all the people that are taking active roles in doing all these things, and we can't be everywhere all the time. And so I'm, I'm really grateful for the people that are, you know, taking leadership roles in some of those, and I encourage everybody to do what they can and eat and be as healthy and think as healthy thoughts as possible. I would like to ask a question of the audience. Uh, how many people believe that from the information you gained this weekend, you're intending to make one sig at least one significant change in your life for better health? Please raise your hand. Okay. Now, first of all, give yourselves a applause. Now, how many people feel like they've got at least five big pieces that they want to work on? Five. How about ten? Raise your hand. Anyone 25? <laughs> right. And does anyone feel overwhelmed? A little, a little, a few, a few? And everyone feels underwhelmed? Bring on more? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay, thank you. I wanted to get a sense. Yeah, and, and I would like to say that one of the, one of the worst things that we can do is, ha is, is wrap ourselves in fear. There are, we've heard a lot of information this weekend, and it certainly could keep us up awake at night. But it can also motivate us to make changes in our own lives and to take some action, even if it is to, um, to join a group um, where you're getting information about one particular subject. I, I kind of hesitate to jump on every single bandwagon because then I'm constantly being bombarded with all the negative information. I really want to know what can I do? What positive step can I take today to make this world a better place? Sometimes it's write a letter to my congressman. Some of the organizations that I belong to make it really easy. All you really have to do is take this letter and sign it and you know send it to these people. And we can do that pretty easily. Um, 
I made a conscious effort about uh, 30 years ago to take positive action in something that makes me feel really good, and that is to help people make positive choices in what they eat because I know that that helps save the lives of animals, it helps save the lives of hum humans, and it also saves the environment. And so eat organically, uh, which also, of course, means uh, GMO-free. I'm really, really going to do something about our cell phone use um, and put it in our newsletters and really take some positive action because we have a lot of readership around the world and I know that we can make a difference there. Um, and I, I know that there are positive things that we can do in our in our own lives that will, you know, th that will not make us all stressed out. And so <clears throat> I really, I, I really want to thank everybody who has brought so much great information to us. I've learned a tremendous amount this weekend, and I want to sleep tonight. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. okay, we're we're coming to the end now, and again. Uh, the workers, uh, let's start with the workers here at the hall and congratulate and thank them for being such gracious hosts. And I don't see Stephen in the hall. Is Stephen here? Stephen, could you come up and bring your children and wife? Because without this man, none of this would have happened. I want to really honor this man. Look at those. What a family, huh? God bless them. <clears throat> and Stephen uh, really put an enormous an econ economic uh, effort into this. So I want you to know that, that this didn't happen for free. And so I appreciate that very much, and he had the courage to do that. Uh, I learned to love this man more every day. Now, to all of you that came here and sat and listened to us uh, either in this hall in New York City in the heart of Manhattan or on your couch or in rooms and halls all throughout the world and the United States. Uh, thank you for being here with us. And let's let this be another positive step in recapturing humanity again. And I'd like to close with some thoughts. Uh, some of you may call this prayer. Some may call it contemplation. Some may go further. But let's close our eyes and have some positive thoughts as we, we leave. Thank you so much for bringing us all together and allowing us to be open and free. Thank you so much for allowing this information to become part of every cell in our bodies. And now it's time for you to help us employ this in our lives. Allow us to be walking examples of what all can achieve and unwavering in our commitment to truth. Thank you so much. God bless all. Enjoy your lives.